Stay tuned. Ahead, I'll talk with David Robleski about Familiaris. This latest novel is a prequel to his multiple award-winning international bestseller, The Story of Edgar Sautel. Both novels were selected for Oprah's Book Club. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Familiaris is an origin story of the Sautel family and their remarkable Sautel dogs. It's a story of unconditional love, grief and healing, determination, joy, and the human-animal bond, and more. David, welcome to Some Books Considered. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Your first novel, The Story of Edgar Sautel, was an international bestseller. And one of the things that gave it a boost was becoming part of the Oprah's Book Club. And this one has too. So I'm just curious about how that came about and your feelings about being and kind of that rarefied air of being as part of her book club. Well, of course, I'm I'm uh, I'm delighted. As for how it came about, I I have no idea. You know, they don't uh, whatever de- deliberations they go through uh, are not uh, is not something that they share. So uh, I I did not expect it. That's uh, that's for sure. I I feel like I got hit by lightning once, and um, good lightning. Um, but I, 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 I it wasn't at all uh, sort of on my uh, radar that it might happen again. So. It was a it was a big surprise, and of course, it's really good. It's good for the book, um, and I I respect um, what she's done. I think um, Familiaris is something like the hundred and sixth book that she's done, uh, and I don't know of anybody who's led in depth discussions of hundred and six books before. Uh, so I, uh, I I feel really lucky to be part of it. Well, this book is a prequel to the first book. It goes back and tells the story of the Sawtell family. For those who might not be familiar with the first book, tell us a little bit about it so we can sort of put the second book in context. Sure. Uh, One of the things I should say up front is that these books can be read in either order. They're not, um, there's no uh, necessity to read one before the other. Either either order is fine. Um, The story of Edgar Sawtell takes place in 1972, and it's, um, it, it takes place over the course of about a year, um, and it's set on this um, farm in remote northern Wisconsin, uh, where the Sawtells raise and train this uh, fictional breed of dogs that are just called Sawtell dogs. Uh, and they have this has been going on for generations in that book. Familiaris uh, tells the story of Edgar's grandfather. It, it could it could. Have been titled the story of Edgar Sawtell's grandfather as a title, not as catchy as Familiaris, I think, but um, but maybe more uh, more accurate. Uh, and it, it talks about how they came to live on that farm in the first place. Where did those people come from? Why did they go there? What were they hoping for? And unlike um, the story of Edgar Sawtell, which unfolds over a year, um, this is a book that follows a long life. Um, over the course of uh, 40 years or so, a little more than 40 years. So it's a very different kind of book um, and uh, it has a very different tone. Uh, it's a much more freewheeling. Um, it, it's, a, it's a different generation of the family and it has a really different vibe. Much, uh, in my opinion, at least, much funnier book. Well, there's a lot here. There's humor, there's loss and grief. There's a mystical part of it. And it covers 40 years of his life, but at some point he also sort of dreams about how man and dog came together. So you go way back uh, before recorded history as well. And I want to talk about some of that in just a moment. But first, let's talk a little bit about the title of the book, because it has multiple meanings as you take in this book. Tell us about sort of the multiple ways one could interpret that title. Well, the, the, the first, the, the, the literal place that it's taken from, of course, is from the Latin name for dogs, Canis familiaris. But I, I, I also, when I look at that word, I see family and uh, the familiar. And uh, so, the, so there, are, uh, there are other meanings to me embedded in that title. And they're all intrinsic to this story. This is about, um, it, it, in many ways, it's about the Sawtell family, but it's also about the larger family that we construct around us out of, uh, out of our friends and what that kind of lifetime relationship is like. Um, 
and I also, to me, I wanted it to evoke not just those uh, decades that the that the story looks at, but the but the species long relationship between people and dogs, which is extraordinary. There's nothing like it in human history. Um, it's uh, to me, it's a, a source of endless fascination that the dogs that I live with are the product of a thousand generations or more of human history and that we've been changed by living with dogs from the very beginning and that uh, dogs or what were uh, were wolves and became dogs have obviously changed over that period of time too. So we've influenced each other um, at, a, at a species level, at a DNA level, literally uh, to be different than we were. I'm always curious about what authors bring to books from their own lives. And it sounds like just as how you describe dogs, that dogs, I'm sure, have been an important part of your life. Tell us a little bit about how that played into writing these novels and and other experiences you had growing up. Uh, I grew up on a little farm in central Wisconsin. And uh, the, the, the setting for both of these books is essentially the farm where I grew up with all the real people evacuated and all new characters put in. Um, uh, and, and on that farm, my, my, my parents raised dogs for uh, five or six years. It was my mom's dream to, to raise dogs. We were very poor. They couldn't afford to do it right. And they made, I think, the, the, the ethical decision at some point to stop because they couldn't do it right and afford it and pay the, pay the mortgage and, and get, have their kids uh, wear good clothes to school and so on. So it was a terrible moment for me because my, my, my chores as a kid was to uh, socialize the pups. So I spent, I spent my days dealing with pups and there, there's just not a bad day when you're playing with puppies. Uh, So, so I, I grew up around dogs. My first memory is of a, a, is of our family dog. And when I started writing Edgar, I was, um, it was a particular moment in time in the, in the world of fiction and also in the, in the world of science where dogs had been considered somehow not worthy of scientific attention, that they were, that they were somehow spoiled, uh, as a, as a sub, as subject matter that's changed now. But at, at the time, uh, I, I, that really bothered me, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to tell uh, a story where the stakes centered around um, owning a dog and being and and living right as a as a dog owner. Um, so I found a dramatic framework to hang that on, um, and uh, in in a way, it was my argument that um, the this this relationship and the stakes that we all experience with our dogs um, are are worthy of thinking about uh, both in an imaginative way and in a scientific way. As you mentioned, your parents didn't have the means to do this, as you say, the right way. But in your book, you talk about the development of these Sautel dogs and obviously, like a lot of things in this book, you had to do some research to make sure you got the details right. So what sort of surprised you along the way about dog breeding and new things that you learned? I, I, one thing I guess I'd say is um, sometimes doing research for a book is, um, is hard work. It's, it's, a, it's a task and you have to get it done. There's nothing hard about researching dogs. <laughs> it's just uh, there, there's no end of things that surprise me. Uh, and, and one of the things that I, I ran into again and again, just incidentally, is the, is the range of abilities that dogs have. I, I have always had this sense of guilt myself as a dog owner that the one thing holding my dog back from its full potential is me. I, uh, I am not uh, a good enough trainer. I can't spend enough time uh, with my dogs to, and, and even living at home as a, uh, as a writer full time, uh, there's not enough time to explore everything that my, my dogs are capable of. Um, 
And so part of the, a big part of the research for, for Edgar and for this book has just been saying, if, if you invent a breed of dogs and the, and the, um, the concept for them is that they're somehow one tiny incremental evolutionary step forward. What does that mean? How do they, how would they behave in, in, in an incredible way? They wouldn't be radically different, but they'd be slightly different, almost imperceptibly different. But there would be moments when they would do things and have um, uh, exhibit behaviors that, that you, you, probably couldn't see in other dogs. So I would have to figure out exactly what is that boundary line. And every time I thought I had set the boundary line, like um, dogs we know can do this, but they can't do this, I would find out I was wrong. And that in fact, you can find examples of dogs doing that thing that I thought was the dividing line. What I think is interesting about canine intelligence is that lately there have been more studies about canine intelligence. And I think, just to generalize this, I think dogs are much more intelligent than they're given credit for. And to me, that kind of begs the question that if this is a more intelligent creature than we thought, then what does that mean for us in terms of the proper way we should be interacting with this animal? Yeah, that's a, that's a very deep and complicated question because, of course, the more um, the more agency you um, allow a dog to have and you, that you believe it has, and the more cognitive uh, ability that you think it has, the, the more morally you are required to devote to that relationship. Um, and I, and I, part of what happens in these stories is that we look at a family who takes that seriously, and it, it ends up being the, the work of their lives to raise these dogs the right way. They don't, they don't raise the dogs the way dogs are typically raised now. For instance, um, they don't place the dogs with owners until they're 18 months old. It's more like a, a guide dog um, uh, sort of protocol for them than, than, is, than is typical because they want to be sure that they're bringing the dogs through their adolescence um, with the, the maximum amount of intellectual stimulation and train and training and behavioral development. Um, and they don't, they don't fundamentally believe that, um, amateurs can do that, that they, they have to do that. And then the dogs are ready to go out into the world. So, I mean, that, that we could talk about this for hours and hours. I think it's endlessly fascinating, but that's one, that's, that's one implication of it, that it's a, it's, much more work, and the responsibility is much greater. I want to come back to John Sautel. You cover 40 years of his life. So how do you kind of break that up? I imagine, you know, over anyone's life, 40 years, you go through different phases in your life. So how did you tackle his story? That's, a, that's an excellent question. The, the one thing that I knew um, about John was there, there was a sort of tossed off line in the story of Edgar Sautel that he was born with an extra share of whimsy. And that, that was really the seed for this book. Like, what is a person like that going to be like? But I didn't want to tell it in a simple chronological way. Um, I'd always envisioned the book as a sort of almost like a biography of this fictional character. Um, and, and it took a couple of years, but where I finally came to was to say, I want to look at five moments in his life, what, um, what I came to think of as the great quests in his life, those moments where you, um, you think you just have a small problem to solve, uh, and it turns out to be one of the, it, first of all, it turns out to be a, a deeper, more complex, life-changing problem to solve, um, and in retrospect, it turns out to have been a turning point in your life. And so I organized the book not in any chrono in a, in a simple chronological way where I'm just ticking off the years, but jumping from moment to moment in his life through these five moments. And in each in each case, he he doesn't really know what he's getting into, and the and the true stakes and the true cost of it isn't uh, isn't apparent uh, until near the end. I'm talking with David Robleski about Familiaris, and our conversation continues. If you appreciate this discussion, please take a moment to subscribe, and thank you. And as you develop this character, he has kind of a unique 
approach on life that he's, like I said, full of whimsy, but also always challenging himself and say, well, how can we do this better? In fact, I'm going to look down and make sure I get the quote right. But he says, suppose you could do one impossible thing. And I'm wondering about what does that tell us about his character and also how that impacts the people around him? John, uh, that that line in particular, um, I, I feel like really captures John. He's uh, later in the book, one of his friends characterizes him as an experiment in what happens when a hopeless optimist comes up against an immovable object. Uh, John is uh, uh, irrationally optimistic about things, and he he insists uh, in in various ways that the people around him also ask what what is the most you could do, not what is you know what is easy or what has been handed to you. Um, and so he has two close friends, uh, and he and he poses this question to both of them. They respond to it in very different ways, but they do respond to it. Even one of them essentially rejects the question, and yet um, uh, as the story goes on, you can see that his life has been organized around responding to it, even as he's rejected it. So uh, uh, I, I, I would like to be around people like that, who set their goals uh, too high. Um, and I've had the good luck to work around a lot of people like that. And so in, in a way, that's um, that's a nod of uh, respect and love to the people that I've worked with in the past. There's so much more in this book we won't have time to talk about, but we do want to touch on just a couple more things. Now, hopefully we've piqued people's interest so that they will read the book. But a couple of fascinating things to me is there's this character, Ida Payne. Tell us about this character and the role that it plays in this story. Ida Payne is a lot of fun. She she appears in the story of Edgar Sawtell as a distant second secondary character, uh, uh, a woman who runs a local small grocery store at a crossroads uh, a couple of miles away from the farm, and who is a sort of uh, oracular presence. She's um, uh, she has a reputation around the uh, around that area for being spooky and. Um, and in in a way, telling foretelling the future. Although oracles, as usual, when they t- foretell the future, they do it in such a way that it's just not helpful at all. And that's and that's true of Ida. I wanted to know more about Ida in this book. So uh, there are, even though there are five episodes in John's life being uh, examined, there are six parts to the book. And the sixth part is, uh, I think of it as the prize in the Cracker Jack box. It's it, it is not about John, only tangentially. Um, but it is the backstory on Ida and where she came from. And as it turns out, she was, um, uh, without giving too much away, she was born in a cataclysmic fire um, in northern Wisconsin that really happened. It's called the Peshtigo Fire. It's not as well known as it probably ought to be because it's one of the most um, devastating fires in American history. But it also happened on the same night of the Great Chicago Fire. And so uh, the history books tend to record what happened in Chicago, and uh, and uh, as a, it's only a footnote what happened in Peshtigo, but in many ways what happened in Peshtigo is is uh, is far more uh, devastating, far more just on a on a uh, sort of natural fury level, far more uh, awesome. So, uh, so there is this sort of sidebar story in in the book about Ida and the uh, the man who uh, who is not her biological father, but who who raises her, beginning in 1871, um, and that all plays into everything that's going to happen later in the book. It happens fairly early in the book, but once you know where Ida has come from, uh, a number of things happen in the book that uh, that you wouldn't make any sense if you didn't know that. The other thing I wanted to touch upon, and it speaks to that sort of human-animal bond again, is this horse in the the story (laughs) that kind of acts like a sort of therapist (laughs) to some of the humans in the story. (laughs) Yeah, there's um, uh, one of the characters is uh, um, named Granddaddy. He's a big draft horse. Uh, He pulls an ice wagon. Um, uh, his, uh, and the, and his owner is uh, named Sojak. And, um, 
the even though um, familiaris is centered around dogs, it doesn't begin there. It takes a while to get there because w- where John learns about the true uh, nature of responsibility between animals is from Sojak and Granddaddy. Sojak has um, organized his life around taking care of this dog or this uh, horse. And he claims that the horse can do all sorts of things and it actually sells time therapy sessions with the horse so people can come and talk to the horse of course he's nearby and he interprets the horse's responses for for the human beings um uh but he so it's partly a it's partly a scam on his part but it's but it's also partly believable and at one point or another in the story uh we see what effect that actually has on some of the characters well this is an epic book and there's, I could talk to you about it for hours, uh, but uh, folks will just have to pick it up and, and uh, learn more about what we've talked about so far. But I do have one last question for you. It's a question I like to ask all authors of fiction, and it's this. If you could spend a day in real life with one of the characters from your novel, who would it be and why? Oh, that's such an easy question. Um, if I if I was forced to choose one character, it would be with John. Although I would really want it to be with John and Mary, um, because the dynamics between them as a couple, and and one way to look at this book is really as a love story um, between John and Mary, and John and all his friends, but especially John and Mary. Um, I've spent so much time imagining what they're like together um, that I would I would just love to see it happen before my actual eyes. Well, this latest book is Familiaris. It's 15 years after the original book. So well worth waiting for, but piques my curiosity. Will we have to wait another 15 years or do you have something else in mind that you're working on? Yeah, I, I really hope not. I, the, it was never the intention for it to take this long. Uh, so um, I do have a couple of books uh, planned, which one I'm going to tackle first, I don't, I haven't decided yet, but there, um, there is more stuff coming. I am not the best predictor of how long it's going to take me to do anything, obviously, but uh, I certainly hope it won't take <laughs> another 15 years. The book is Familiaris by David Robleski. David, thank you for talking with me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you'd like to purchase Familiaris, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered. Here are a couple more interviews you might find interesting.